And then there was Joseph. You talk about an early Jesus model of what life can be like facing the most hostile opposition imaginable, the most hurtful rejection imaginable. And then there's Joseph. A model so powerful that many view these uh, t- some 12 chapters of the book of, of Genesis devoted to him, more space to Joseph than any of his predecessors. Father, grandfather, great-grandfather, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph occupies a, a central place because he models for us, and many refer to the model as, as Joseph being a type of Jesus. A predictor, a model of him 2,000 years in advance. And then there was Joseph. Bizarre, wasn't it? Big family, lots of kids. He's at the bottom of the totem pole as the young dude. And the others are sensing favoritism, jealousy, all kinds of stuff coming in the family dynamic because of what's perceived as of Joseph having that special place in the, in the heart of mom and dad. And man, that jealousy turned nasty, didn't it? Talk about betrayal by those the closest to, the most devoted to, the most loving relationships with. You talk about the Romans 12 love word phileo from the same womb. Man, they were family and the ultimate family betrayal really selling him out in the literal sense of the term, wasn't it? Dad thought he was dead. And the, he's gone. And, and, and suddenly finds himself, instead of being the object of the, you know, the young guy in a big family loved and cared for and nurtured and protected and, and, and given so much emotional support, here he, is, here he is being sold as a slave. You think he had a reason to be embittered? You think he had a reason for a heart to swell with rage and resentment? A mindset that might be growing over time. I'm going to get even with those. Think so? Listen, if you and I were in that place, you don't want to become presumptuous, do you? I, I don't. I think I'd have a real difficult time squashing the rage and anger building. And there he was in Potiphar's house, and you got the whole issue with his wife trying to seduce him, and accusations and false accusations, and Potiphar's accusations. And it gets from bad to worse. But what do we have of Joseph? The guy seems like a superman, doesn't he? Just maintaining faithfulness in the midst of false accusations. And man, he ends up, he ends up growing in, in honor and respect. And even when he ends up in, in jails and he ends up in Pharaoh and God gives him the supernatural giftedness of interpreting dreams. I mean, from the bottom of the heap where he could have been consumed by rage, anger, resentment, revenge driven He ends up moving up the ladder as a foreigner in a strange land, ends up essentially becoming the equivalent of the powerful vice president of of Egypt. And wow, like how can that happen? No bitterness at all, but it really could have got tested at the end, didn't it? We, We know the story. In the providence of God, famine back home, Brothers come in trying to get relief help in, in Egypt to, to bring back. And, and what happens is, lo and behold, what a coinkydink, huh? What a, what a coincidence. In the providence of God, there they meet up after such a, a long period of time. Be honest with yourself. Hmm? Try to be honest with myself. Here you are way up at the top and here they are way at the bottom. Think maybe there'd be a natural, impulsive, or instinctive tendency to say, now it's time to get even. Now it's royal payback. Huh? And what do you see coming out of Joseph? Man, there is love and there is grace and there is mercy and there is forgiveness. And gosh, we're 2,000 years before Calvary. Where'd that all come from? 
Not like he's got the indwelling spirit of God and regeneration and new life and, and the word of God in his life and a, and a family of believers encouraging him. You talk about isolation and alone. Joseph becomes an extraordinary model and a picture and a type of what Jesus would ultimately model himself. And we read it last week, but gosh, we got to go back there this morning to make this turn in transition. Peter himself was so impacted by the model of Jesus, and, and we ought to understand why the impact was so great for Peter. Because if there's any one of the remaining 11 who would have had a reason to think, God's got a reason to get me back. To have it in for me. Jesus would have a reason for payback for all of the the betrayal against Jesus at that sacred holy moment of all of his rejection and and scourging and, and the denials. Peter's just blown away by the grace of Jesus. Wasn't he? I mean, John 21, resurrection, Jesus. It's not like Peter's thinking, oh man, I am in royal trouble. Hey, Pete, you love me? Because I still love you. No, no, no. This is is hug time. This is restore time. This is renewal time. This is greater prep. And Peter ends up at the other side of things, right? So why is he writing about the model of Jesus? Because he was on the receiving end of the one who who giveth more grace when the burdens are greater. And so you got 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter's impressed with the model of Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. We we noted it last week because Pete's quoting from the prophet Isaiah 700 years in advance. In 1 Peter 2.22, he's quoting the great suffering servant passage. Here's the example of Jesus that just blew away Peter that that 2,000 years before Joseph had been modeling. The quote from 1 Peter 2.22, What about Jesus who committed no sin? My goodness, you kidding me? That kind of betrayal, that kind of hatred, that kind of rage, that kind of hostility, that kind of opposition, that kind of rejection, the Holy Almighty God in human form coming to redeem them. He came to his own, but his own received them not. He committed no sin. That's a testimony of all who were around him. At the trial, they all acknowledged the same. No fault, no fault, innocent, no fault. The apostles lived with him for three plus years. They saw it. Committed no sin. Paul's affirmative statement of 2 Corinthians 5.21, who knew no sin? Peter quotes it. Who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. There was no sin in action. There was no sin in contemplation. There was no sin in meditation. There was no sin in verbal communication. There was no sin in any way, shape, or form. They never saw a tinge of it. Never heard a mutter under his breath. Don't get theirs. Don't worry, guy. Day's coming. Vengeance is... None of that here. Peter's blown away by it all. It's, It's the model of Jesus. But much, much, much more than that. If the model of Jesus, the example of Jesus 2,000 years before illustrated in Joseph, if that isn't hard enough, frankly, it's what precedes 1 Peter 2.22 that really is over the top. Because apparently, not even apparently, definitively, God calls you and me to follow the footsteps 2,000 years earlier by Joseph, to follow the footsteps 2,000 years back for us now of Jesus. 
Because that's where he is. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. We've got to look at these verses because this is Romans 12, 17 to 21. And it's not easy. It's horribly convicting, humbling. You really expect me, God, to be at this place? Verse 19, the context is believers serving employers, masters who are unjustly treating them. Unfair, undeserved, unwarranted, harsh. Strikes at the fairness doctrine, which we're polluted with in our culture. Spoiled, polluted, we're constantly demanding fairness. We've got to rethink a whole lot from a biblical worldview mindset. Here in verse 19 of 1 Peter 2, it finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a man, a believer in Jesus, bears up endures under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Catch that? Unjustly. Not fair, not even legal. I didn't do anything. Hmm. There's almost a degree in verse 20, if you read it a certain way, it could almost sound sarcastic. It's not. It's intended to prove a point. What credit is there if when you sin and you're harshly treated, you endure it with patience? It's like if I screw up, if I make an idiot of myself, if I cause my own pain and hardship and then I'm enduring the consequences of it and I think, my, what a wonderful model I am. No, you're not. You caused your own pain, you idiot. What do you do? There's nothing great about that at all. You deserve, in a certain sense, what you're going through. But, contrast, middle of verse 20, if when you do what is right... Do what is righteous. Do what is honorable. Do what God approves of. If when you are obeying him and you're following him and you're honoring him and you're lifting up Jesus by example, by model, by word, by deed, by heart, by attitude, and you you think honestly, humbly before God, I really want to exalt Jesus and how I'm responding. But in spite of all of that, you still suffer. And you determine I'm going to follow the footsteps of Jesus and patiently hanging in there, endure it. Hupo meno, I'm I'm staying under the fire. God's put me here. Not fair through my lens. Jesus went through a million fold more than me. I'm hanging in there. This, end of verse 20, finds Favor, grace. He giveth more grace. That's who he gives it to. And then Peter throws in the wallop of verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose. Talk about life purpose. Talk about life design. You have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, parentheses, unjustly, unwarranted, undeserving, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Swallow hard, huh? Doesn't this run against the grain of everything we instinctively perceive to be human, to be normal? 
Everything about us screams, get back, justify myself, defend myself, demand respect, demand that you acknowledge my rightness. Especially in our culture. Now this is precisely where Jesus was in his teaching when he began his public ministry. In the familiar words of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, we only did a portion of it last week, but got to go back here for the portion we missed. Because Jesus is teaching the same principle early on in Matthew 5 when he rejects the Pharisaic interpretation of the Mosaic law of the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth principle that he quotes in Matthew 5, verse 38, that the Pharisees used to justify getting even. And Jesus is acknowledging they've screwed that up like they did everything else. Within the context of Deuteronomy, it was always something entrusted exclusively to those who had authority in a governing structure, not to individual response to mistreatment, never given for that purpose, which is why Jesus follows with the ideas of right surrendering. We don't have a right to demand or require justice. But it's verse 43 of Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Again, that was rabbinic teaching, distorting the law. The rabbis essentially taught love fellow Jews. The goyim, the the Gentiles, they're, they're losers. Hate them. Jesus said, verse 44 of Matthew 5, But I say unto you, and when he's saying that, he's not offering new teaching. He's offering what was intended from the beginning that the rabbis messed up. When he said, listen, you're going to also love your enemies. The ones who persecute you, the ones who are hostile toward you, the ones who insult you, the ones who mistreat you, the ones who misuse you, the ones who are unjust toward you, the ones who oppress you, the ones who beat you down, love them. And he adds to it at the end of verse 44, you've got to pray for them. Which implies an awareness of spiritual need, doesn't it? It implies that we are thinking in a radically different lens. And we're getting here now with Romans chapter 12. So I want to go back to Romans 12. Because here's the Apostle Paul addressing this whole issue of not just loving up on each other because we have all of these commonalities as fellow believers in Jesus and we share so much with each other. We're indwelt by the same Spirit of God. We're indwelt by the same Jesus. We now have the same understanding, growing as it is, of who God is and who we were in our lostness and sin and who we are now becoming in Christ. And we're sharing all that together. And we're sharing a love for Jesus together and a love for the Word of God together and a love for speaking Jesus together and making Him known together and serving each other. There's so much common ground. It's easier, huh, to love each other. But, we already saw in the end of this paragraph, verses 9 to 16, on relationships with fellow believers being uh, completely altered by our relationship with God. Because we're transformed by the renewing of our mind in verse 2 and verse 3. We're not looking at ourselves haughty as being more important than somebody else. We're a family. We're on the same equal ground. And you're more important than, than I am. That's verse 10. And we saw that playing out, even with hard needs. There's a little inference of what's coming in, in verse 14. We noted that a couple of weeks ago. Because even among family of God... There's conflicts, right? We get on each other's nerves. We tick each other off. Even believers in Jesus get ticked with each other. And, and so verse, verse 14 is kind of a, a little bit of a, of a seed sown of what's now being mined in verses 17 to 21. Among believers, verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. Let's, let's face it, if we're fellow believers in Jesus and there's conflict and resentment, 
we feel like somebody's mistreating us, hostile toward us, hurting us, we've got a whole foundation of principles by which that stuff must, not possibly can, but must be resolved. We don't have any options, right? Because confessing sin and repentance of sin and forgiving each other, that's all built into the framework of how we're now rewired, right? We know what forgiveness is. Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to each other, forgiving each other. Just as God in Christ has forgiven me, we all know what it means to be forgiven. We all know what it means to be washed of all of our all of our garbage. We know what it means to be on the receiving end of grace and mercy and love. Well, how can we pause in giving it out? If we get it by grace, we give it by grace. If we get it when we don't deserve it, we give it when we think they don't deserve it. Maybe we don't deserve it. And so we've got all the premise to be able to deal with this stuff when it comes to believer to believer. But now verses 17 to 21, we don't have common ground with unbelievers, right? We don't have a common mindset, common heart, transformation, regeneration. There's no commonality spiritually whatsoever. We're in literally different worlds. And we're facing it from them. 17 to 19 lays out these four principles that challenge us at this core level of our response from unbelievers who are persecuting us in the worst imaginable ways. We dealt with the first phrase of verse 17 last week. The strong negative statements for emphasis. Never. It's repeated again in the beginning of verse 19. Never. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. The issue of retaliation. Absolutely never. Never. Dealt with all that last week. Want to move to the next phrase of verse 17. Principle number two. From the issue of retaliation, I call this the issue of recognition. Now this is really hard because we completely lose our frame of reference. It's a stunning statement at the end of verse 17. Respect what is right in the sight of All men. Again, one of the terms helping us understand we're dealing now not just believer-believer relationship, but believer-unbeliever relationship. All men in, in verse 17. The end of verse 18, all men. Repeated. Respect what's right in the sight of all men. And the the word respect means I'm going to take thought of. I'm going to contemplate in advance. I've got to process this and think this through. Listen, we've got to come to grips with something. A lot of the issues that come from believer-unbeliever relationship, especially hostile relationship, negative stuff we're getting from them, persecution, accusation, anger, just, just think for a second with me. What in the world do we expect? What, what are we expecting? What are just the core differences between someone who is, who is lost still in sin, who is still described by the first section of Romans, Romans 1.18 through chapter 3, verse 20, where are they at compared to us? Well, we ought to know where we are. We're Romans 3.21 and on. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been given a new heart, regeneration, spiritual life implanted within me. Where'd that come from? Came from God. Did I win it? Did I earn it? Did I self-produce it? Did I arrive at it? Did I intellectualize it? Did I discover it from my own brilliance? Was it a treasure hunt and suddenly there was the treasure? It's God drawing me to himself. It's God removing the scales from my eyes to see and and, and removing the deafness from my ears and and God giving me the ability to, to perceive what I could not discover and perceive on my own. What happens once we come to Jesus? I discover a new perspective of who God is. I discover a very different perspective of who I was and who I now am. I discover what spiritual life in me produces. 
And my entire worldview begins to radically change. Why? Because I read a philosophy book? No, it's because new life gives me new understanding of the eternal principles of the Word of God that are now dynamic and alive. The Word of God is quick and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. The gospel is endunomai explosive. And so I'm discovering a whole new view of the universe, of the eternal creator, of divine design in creating me, of spiritual life. Everything changes. Why do we expect unbelievers who are dead in their tra- transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2, one? why do we expect unbelievers to get it? I mean, how reasonable is it? How, how sensible and reasonable is it for us to expect that those who are in spiritual darkness, who are utterly lost, who are Ephesians 2, 2, and 3, under the influences of the culture, this world system, under the influence of their own sinful nature and impulses, and under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. How do we expect them to grasp what I grasp? to think the way I think, to understand what I understand, and I'm going to just convince them of my brilliance and logic, and everything will just be wonderful. It is impossible for them to get it. They can only see through one lens, a one lens with a a lot of different quarters in it, a lot of different ideas and concepts of worldview and of life, that, that Jesus describes in Matthew 7 as wide as the road that leads to destruction. There's lots of roads, lots of directions, lots of paths, lots of belief system, lots of ideas, lots of concept, but the ends thereof, Proverbs 14, 12, are the ways of death. So we will encounter from the enemy Thinking, ideas, concepts, worldview, belief systems that we know are nuts. Clueless. No clue. So what am I going to do? I'm going to enter into a world in which I am going to require you to get what I know. And I'm going to beat you down one way or another until you get it. By the way, historically for the quasi-Christian world, over several thousand years, there are many who call themselves Christians who have tried to do that to people. My people are among many who are utterly turned off to Jesus because of that kind of stuff. When Paul says, respect what is right in the sight of all men, he's speaking to the issue of recognition. That is, we got to recognize something, understand something, and grasp something. They are absolutely persuaded that they're right. They're, they're, they're convinced they're right. And if all I'm going to do is enter into a, a, a war, war of words, expecting that somehow... I am going to demand of them, require of them that they think differently. That is utterly ludicrous. Because if God doesn't breathe spiritual life into them, what are we doing? I'm not saying we don't talk, but it's what we're saying, what we're talking, what we're discussing, what we're engaging in and how we're presenting. That's a different issue, especially when they are hostile in belief system. We're in a culture I mean, it's not 1950 anymore. It isn't Leave it to Beaver. It isn't the Partridge family. The, the world's changed. The hostility toward a Christian worldview, if we don't get it now, we need to, you know, come out of fantasy land. It, it's, it, is, it is increasing precipitously, exponentially. The, the anger and resentment of our culture toward anything that is biblically centric is exploding with rage against us. That is this age. 
to get to a place where you can have any kind of an interactive discussion where there is listening and give and take, it's increasingly difficult to be there. And the likelihood is going to get worse before it gets, if it ever gets better, not likely. That's my own thought. But if I'm going to get angry in return, if I'm going to get resentful in return, if I'm going to perceive their spears and their attacks against me, and I'm going to take this personal, and I'm going to get, what in the world? Where are we going? They can't think any differently. It may be utterly foolish and wrong. It may be as foreign to truth as could possibly be, but it is the end of verse 17. It is right to them, truth to them. And I'm going to have to understand where they're at and where they're not. I'm going to have to understand what they're getting and and what they're not getting. And I'm going to have to be enduring enough and patient enough and trusting enough to be able to say, you know, I, I can't require this of them. I, I got I to hang in there over the long haul. I'm not going to react to their anger. I'm going to understand that's, that's all they have to offer. That's true in debating religions. It's true in debating cultures. Think of all the socio-political stuff that creates hostility in our age. It never was here 70 years ago. The whole homosexuality, lesbianism, transgender issue. The abortion issue. Those are some of the biggies, right? Real biggies. What, what, what are our expectations? What, 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 are, what are we thinking? What are we requiring of them as lost as the culture is and as far as the culture is straight in 70 years? This is an atheistic, secular, materialistic, there is no God, there are no morality, fixed points, there are no absolutes, there are no standards, that lock in, they shift with a culture. What do we expect? They can't think differently. It's not possible. You won't win this battle in a political forum. One-on-one, truth-driven discussion, respectful interaction, Respecting what's right in the sight of all men. I know it's as lost as can be, as godless as it can be, but what did Jesus do? He met the utterly lost where they were. Remember how he responded to those who were lost? Matthew 9, 36 to 38. He looks upon them with with compassion. They are distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. They are spiritually lost in need of regeneration. And he tells his guys, we need to pray for their spiritual condition. Because unless God changes the heart, the mind's not going to be changed. And unless the heart and mind aren't going to be changed, worldview's not going to change. Nothing will change unless God produces new life. And if we think we're going to win this battle on a philosophical level, level, we are looking down an empty road. The only thing that's going to change thinking is new life, is the gospel. Which is why in the end it's all about sharing Jesus. It's all about communicating biblical truth of, of who God is and who we are and what sin is. And man, if we're not there, we will never see transformation. I'm not going to go any further than this point. We'll be able to cover the other ones next week. We need to think in a radically different way. This is a powerful principle. 
it, it connects with the, the third point that we'll deal with more next week. I call it the issue of restoration, how to make peace with when there's this kind of hostility. And, and, and those, those conditional clauses in the beginning of verse 18 are significant, if possible. Because in some situations with unbelievers, it's not possible. So far as it depends on you. Can't change them. Can't require them. Can't demand of them. If they're believers in Jesus, there are requirements. There's pressure to be put in, in terms of, of, of compelling repentance and restoration and relationships from Matthew 5 and, and Matthew 18 and elsewhere. Y- yeah, there there is, but... Not when there's an unbeliever. The only thing I own is me. I got to own my response to them. Am I really? Am I really pursuing shalom, pursuing peace? Am I exercising godly wisdom in my relationships to them? My response to them? Am I being Jesus before them? Am I being Joseph before them? God help us in in an increasingly unbelieving, lost culture. We need to see ourselves in a different way, our world in a different way, our neighbors in a different way, our enemies, our opposers, our persecutors in a different way. And maybe more than anything, we need to see our role, our purpose in a different way. Because all they oppose us on is, in the end, only showing the desperateness of their spiritual lostness. And unless there is a renewing of the heart and a renewing of the mind that only comes from spiritual life, thinking's not going to change. It'll be worse. Frankly, for me, that makes it easier. Because it it now redefines with greater clarity what's my mission? What's my calling? What's my purpose? And it's not to Christianize America in a political system. It's to bring the gospel to lost people because only the truth of the gospel and deutomai, only that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It just makes it really clear to me. It's all about making Jesus known. It's all about sharing our transformed life and testimony. It's all about him introducing lost people to Jesus. Isn't that good news? They really need him. Let's pray together. Lord, in, in the midst of the fog, in the midst of the culture, in the midst of the age in which we're in, help us to, to see our place with greater clarity, our significance, our role, our identity, our calling, our ministry. Help us to identify what our ministry isn't and be able to see what our ministry and calling is. Thank you that we have Jesus as our model. Thank you we never journey alone. Thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of knowing you want to use us to touch the lives of lost people. And so we give ourselves to you for that privilege, that honor of making Jesus known. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.